Well, good morning, afternoon, evening to all of you, and many thanks once again for your participation. We're delighted to have Campbell Harvey as our distinguished speaker to kick off the second day of our 35th annual conference for official institutions. Well, I can tell you that this is a subject of great personal interest to me, so I can really wait to get started. But first, do allow me to introduce our very special guest. Campbell Harvey is a Canadian economist. He was the first to show that inverted yield curves predict recessions. He also was the first to argue that half of the empirical research in finance is false and has also published important studies in behavioral finance and corporate finance. He's professor of finance at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In 2016, he was president of the American Finance Association. Professor Harvey earned his doctorate in business finance from the University of Chicago. He has taught at the Stockholm School of Economics, the Helsinki School of Economics, and the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. He also has served as a visiting scholar at the Federal Research Systems Board of Government, and he is an American Finance Association Fellow. Harvey received the Journal of Portfolio Management's Best Papers Award in 2016 and 2015 for his research on distinguishing luck from skill. He has also received eight Grand Dot Awards scrolls from the CFA Institute for Excellence in Financial Writing and has published over 150 scholarly articles on investment finance, emerging markets, corporate and behavioral finance, financial econometrics, and computer science. From 2006 to 2012, Harvey was the editor of the Journal of Finance, the leading scientific journal in his field, and one of the most prestigious journals in the economic profession. Professor Harvey has taught innovation and crypto ventures at Duke University for the past seven years. The course is primarily concerned with blockchain technology and decentralized finance. He also teaches technology-driven business transformation and international finance, and also has a Coursera course called Blockchain Business Models. Today, we will be talking about his book, DeFi and the Future of Finance, which just came off the press as it was released a couple months ago in precisely the fall of 2021. So good morning, Cam, and welcome to our conference. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm looking forward to our chat. Well, wonderful. Clem, as, as I mentioned, it is a pleasure to have you with us. We are extremely grateful and, and honored. And I can tell you that after reading your book, I find it extremely exciting, but both in a positive and also in a somehow anxious way. So I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to discuss it uh, with you. So Cam, uh, you know, you, you clearly are an established figure in the fields of economics and finance and for a large uh, part of your career, well, you're recognized for many very important innovations, mostly in economics and investment related subjects. But I am curious to hear from you, how do you get uh, to become interested in, in, the, in the crypto space? So much of my career, my research is about positioning for the future. So you mentioned my inverted yield curve dissertation showing that that forecasts future economic growth and recessions in particular. And it's done really well out of sample uh, since my dissertation. Uh, in that it, uh, it got all of the recessions in advance. In other parts of my research, also the same thing, where you're looking at various information in the economy that helps you dynamically adjust the positioning of your portfolio for the future. So finance really is all about the future. There's other fields like accounting, which is very valuable, but it's about understanding um, where you are today and the past. That's, again, that's key information, but finance is 
very much looking forward. So a stock obviously is just the value of cash flows in the future. So my story is kind of related to this in that after uh, you mentioned that I was editor of the Journal of Finance, uh, and this was 2006 to 2012, um, I went back to my international finance course in 2013 and decided, well, I'm not going to do the same material that I did seven years ago. The world has changed. I want to update what I teach. And I've got a module on uh, foreign exchange. And I decided, well, why don't I add material on cryptocurrency? That would be new. And I don't know that much about it. So I'm a curious person. And anything that's got the possibility of having an impact on the future, I want to investigate. And that's where I started. So I started with the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper that uh, is from 2008. And I read that paper and I, I couldn't believe it. Like it, it was, wow, this is a paper, like I'm the editor of a scientific journal. We go through the peer review process, it's very painful. Um, and, and a very small fraction of papers are published, maybe 5% of them and the journal I edited. This is not like that. It is a white paper that's on the internet. You're just sitting there and we don't even know who the author is. It, it could be a he, a she, it could be a group of people, very mysterious, but I read the paper, then I read it again. And I'm thinking, well, this is a big idea, really big idea. And then I went down the so-called rabbit hole and started to learn about this space. And it is a very interesting space in that it is the confluence of well-established ideas. So in computer science, distributed uh, systems and, um, and, and cryptography, of course, uh, there's also some game theory from economics and financial economics, uh, of course. You put all this together, and that's what uh, this white paper actually did. Uh, and you've got something that is really interesting and, and, and really challenges the traditional model of, uh, of finance. And of course, uh, the, if you know about this uh, Satoshi Nakamoto uh, white paper, it actually... Uh, features uh, a reference to the global financial crisis and the poor job that our banking regulators did in the crisis, uh, uh, the lead up uh, to the crisis, where they let the large commercial banks basically act like hedge funds. And when the leverage was so high and something happens, you get wiped out. And what the uh, solution was to bail them out. And I think at that point, uh, that was a trigger for a lot of people that we need to rebuild the financial system. We need to rebuild it from scratch. And we're not going to do this in the usual method. So many of the people in the space had minimal knowledge of economics and finance, but they brought different tools and uh, it's an ongoing uh, process. So I did this in 2013 and I did a lecture, a single lecture uh, that was two hours long in my course. I was nervous because it was a little outside of my <laughs> comfort zone. Um, and, and the story goes, it's kind of interesting. And we all remember taking uh, college classes and at the top of the hour, you finish the lecture, you don't go one minute late, you don't go two minutes late, that's a disaster. At the top of the hour, people just leave. They just bolt. And I thought I was at the top of the hour. I finished my lecture, which was two hours, right? So it's a long a lecture. And students just sat there. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, uh, maybe I finished early? But no, um, it was on time. And then my second thought is, oh, this must have been just a horrible lecture. They're stunned uh, that it was so bad. I bombed this lecture. But no, that wasn't the case either because they came to the front and said, well, this is a transformational idea that this should not be a lecture. This should be a whole course, a learning experience, maybe more than a course. And that really inspired me to dig deeper and deeper. And uh, today I teach this course, which is 
largely uh, decentralized finance. And you mentioned a, a Coursera. I actually have four Courseras that are focused on decentralized finance, and they've just been launched within the last couple of weeks. So uh, I'm definitely into this. And again, I think it's important to give my students a vision of the future. That's very important for their decisions in terms of how they're going to allocate their own human capital. And uh, again, finance is about the future. This is a disruptive technology that challenges the current model. Uh, and, and I think it has a lot of promise in terms of what it can do. Well, Cam, that's really fascinating. I, I wish I would have been there, but uh, anyway, just being here, listening to you, it's, it's, it's really exhilarating. Um, let's see, we, we have a, a lot of ground to cover and, uh, you know, a couple of things. I, I would like, uh, on the one hand, to cover some of the foundations of, uh, of DeFi because uh, you know we, we have a heterogeneous group and, and, and they, they may be in different places in the, in the learning uh, curve. But then also in, in our audience, uh, a, a large uh, portion is composed by, by central bank uh, reserve managers and, and also from other areas. And uh, th there are a couple of uh, use cases. Well, one, one, the particular implications of DeFi for, for central banking as we know it. And then also I, I would like to explore in some detail uh, the use case for, for portfolio management in a, in a DeFi uh, world. But uh, I mean, first, first uh, things first, what is uh, DeFi? How, how would you go about explaining that to, to our audience? So it's basically a technology and it's got many different aspects to it. Let me give you a simplified uh, example, and that's a decentralized exchange, or we sometimes call it DEX. So I've got asset one, and I'm looking to exchange it for asset two. So the usual way I do that is uh, I establish an account with my broker and go through that process there bureaucracy and back office and, and things like that. So in decentralized finance, I actually send asset one to an algorithm. And this algorithm exists, for example, in the Ethereum blockchain. And then that algorithm sends me back asset two. So I'm interacting with an algorithm. We call these algorithms smart contracts, but that's not really important. Uh, the algorithm I can use at any time, so 24 seven, the algorithm, I can see the code behind it. So it's completely transparent. I can see the balances of asset one and asset two. So that's transparent. And I've got a very good idea of the exchange rate between asset one and asset two that I will get. And indeed I could put a bound on it that if I don't like it, then the, the transaction's canceled. So it's not too difficult to imagine in the future that we will be interacting with algorithms and not just in finance. So we're already seeing that uh, today. So, so this idea of decentralized exchange where you cut out the broker, this is an algorithm. The algorithm doesn't care if you're buying or selling. It doesn't care who you are. It's just like a very efficient way to do exchange. And effectively what it's doing is it's matching peers. So it's so-called peer to peer. Whereas if we interact with a traditional broker, uh, that's not peer to peer, there's a middle person. And let me also emphasize while I'm talking about decentralized exchange, that I'm not talking about Coinbase or Binance or Kraken. The, those are centralized exchanges. Those are just brokers. So I sometimes call them um, C DeFi, so C E D E F I. So they're centralized institutions that deal with a, a lot of decentralized finance. So decentralized finance is not about those exchanges or brokers. It's about a way to match uh, people individually. So the first aspect of DeFi is exchange, and it's done in a decentralized way. Uh, there's also savings and lending protocols. And again, what we would usually do, we go to the bank and deposit our money and get like a trivial, if, if any, a rate of return on that. 
and we lose money in real terms because of the level of inflation uh, today. With these protocols, you don't have all of the expenses. So you don't have the buildings. You don't have all of the employees, uh, the back office, the money that you need to spend on computer security and, and stuff like that. It is completely absent. So when you take all of those costs out, it makes sense that the savings rate can be higher than in uh, a commercial bank and the borrowing rates, um, they can be lower. So you take a, a friction out of the system. So decentralized finance is uh, also about savings and lending uh, done in a way, again, that it doesn't matter who you are. And it's also much deeper, of course, uh, there are insurance applications, there's uh, tokenization in general. Um, so various assets could be tokenized in a blockchain and, and traded very uh, efficiently. It's about payments, it, it, it goes very deep, but the key thing is that there's no central institution running any of this. It is literally a computer program that resides on a number of computers within, let's say, the Ethereum uh, network, and you interact with that. So that's essentially what decentralized finance is. Well, so so many things you you put in there. I I, I don't know where, where to go, but uh, what one thing that that you do mention in your book, and I did find it to be a really you know, mind-blowing idea is is how, how you go about uh, talking about the origins of money. You know, uh, going back to 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 the barter uh, way that that exchanges took place, and then how how we are potentially or or, or effectively coming in in a full circle to 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 barter without needing a currencies at all in in the future and if, if you could expand a bit on on, on that idea i think it's, yeah. it's really a, a transformational concept uh, that, that you bring out in your book it, it was transformational to me because i'm trained in economics at the university of chicago and and we do economic history and we start with barter right that's the first kind of market exchange and it was a horrible way to transact because you had to exactly match. Um, you know, that I've, I've got uh, I've got two pigs, and I I want um, like a cow, and you need to find the exact match where the other person wants the two pigs and willing to give the cow. So very very uh, difficult uh, to actually pull off, and that led to the rise of money as we know it. So money was used uh, for transactions as a store of value and, and market exchange became very, very efficient, but only to a certain degree. And uh, if you look at the frictions today in terms of doing transactions, they are very large. So in the United States, it's just routine when you swipe a credit card to pay 3%. In other countries, it's more than 3%. I, I feature a wire transfer from uh, one of the first Western Union wire transfers in my book from 1873. It's for $300 and the fee is $9, which is 3%. And at 150 years and very little's changed. And, and just by the way, uh, this has been uh, attacked on, on the uh, social media um, because somebody actually went out and tried to do a Western Union $300 transfer and the fee was much more than $9. So uh, this person argued things got actually worse uh, than 150 years ago. But the point is that you've got all of these frictions and what tokenization allows is to have a digital representation of various different uh, things of value. So, so for example, I could have a token that is backed by US dollars. I could have a token that's backed by gold. I could have a token that's backed by IBM stock. So 
So what DeFi actually does is it allows us to expand our concept of like money and value, where I go to the store and I want to buy some groceries. And then I open my wallet, which is my smartphone. And it's also, I call it a wallet, but it's also a bank. It's your bank, your personal bank. And then I've got various assets in my wallet and I choose what I want to use. And maybe I, I choose gold. And maybe it's the case that the merchant or the grocery store, they don't want the gold, but it's completely seamless. So I exchange in the decentralized exchange. And again, the, the user has no idea what's going on here. I use my gold and it is exchanged for something that the merchant actually wants. Transaction goes through very quickly. Okay, so, so the full circle, when I say this, and so I think actually the first sentence in my book, uh, that what I mean by that is tokenization allows us to return to barter. That, that there's so many different ways that we can represent value very efficiently and actually use that as a substitute for traditional uh, money. So a national currency, uh, for example. So we've got these other options. And, and, and this is barter. So it's a different type of barter that is very efficient. So I do think that this is definitely something that the central banks have noticed. So I don't think they care as much about the price gyrations of Bitcoin or Elon Musk um, and his tweets about Dogecoin. I don't think they really care about that. Uh, what they, they do care about is that they've had a monopoly on the uh, on money and they make a lot of money off of their monopoly on money senior age and all of a sudden in a very efficient way and and just to be clear more efficient than the current system so the current system in in the us to transfer money from one institution to another that could take two to five days and it might be rejected so there might be an issue with it. All of this happens very quickly. So you've got another alternative that is a way to exchange value or a store of value that operates much more efficiently than uh, what we've got uh, today. So that is a, is a real threat, I would say, definitely. Well, so many fascinating things that you laid out in, in there, but. Uh... And, and, and we, we'll follow up on, on that. But I, I did want to, to stop a bit before uh, proceeding on that to, to, to talk about uh, some uh, enabler, uh, foundational enablers to, to DeFi. And, and if you could, could explain that a bit. For, for some people, uh, all they may know about uh, crypto is, is just Bitcoin, and they may have heard of uh, Ethereum or, or others, but they may not know the difference between one and, and, and the others. But then Ethereum, which is the, the example that, that you use in, in your book, it's it's really uh, different and, and much more versatile than, than Bitcoin and, and actually becomes these features are the ones that, that become the, the enablers of uh, DeFi. So if, if you could could explain a, a bit for, for the audience to, to familiarize on, on, on why this is so, so important. Yes. So... Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency and launched in, in 2009. And it's still the currency that holds the most value. And uh, Ethereum was developed to essentially improve upon the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. And there's a very specific uh, improvement that's crucial for decentralized finance. So in Bitcoin, you can use Bitcoin as a transaction mechanism. And that was the original idea of Satoshi Nakamoto. So I can send you some Bitcoin quite easily and you can send me some Bitcoin. So what Ethereum actually does is that it enriches the idea so that 
we can have a third way to send and we can send funds, not just to different people, but we can send funds to a smart contract that resides in the Ethereum uh, blockchain. So it's a different address. And we're able uh, to actually run a computer program in the Ethereum uh, blockchain. You cannot do that today in the Bitcoin blockchain. So these computer programs are, are crucial uh, for decentralized uh, finance. It's something, as I said, that Ethereum has that Bitcoin doesn't. So if you think of the value proposition of Ethereum, it's a lot easier to think about because we know, for example, Amazon, AWS, uh, you can buy uh, computing uh, power from Amazon and therefore AWS is valuable. Well, with Ethereum, it's the same thing that I can deploy a contract in Ethereum and that can be run. So that's providing a service. And I gave an example earlier on of uh, you send asset one uh, to a contract, you get asset two back, a very simple decentralized exchange. But this is, this is valuable uh, to actually do. So, so it is a different value a proposition and uh, almost all of decentralized finance is focused on ethereum right now there are um ethereum like blockchains that you can do decentralized uh, finance on um and and they actually many of them have improved upon ethereum's uh ideas so one thing that is certainly in the news these days is the mechanism whereby the transactions are approved and added to this ledger that exists on many different uh, computers. And the original idea in Bitcoin was to use uh, a proof that is very computationally expensive and very energy hungry. And Ethereum essentially has the same thing. So both of these uh, technologies are environmentally reckless. So Bitcoin alone is using the electricity of the country of Argentina. Okay, so um, these competitors to Ethereum have actually figured out, well, we need to change that. We can use a different technology that's much more energy uh, efficient. And Ethereum in its uh, version 2.0, which will likely be launched in 2022, will switch over. So that'll be very important because when you've got that energy efficiency where you're not doing damage uh, to the environment like Ethereum is doing and Bitcoin especially, I think that's very important for the future of this technology. It also allows us to greatly scale uh, the number of transactions we can do uh, per second. But another part of your question is really important because it's, well, how do I get involved in this? I've heard about it, maybe you're listening to this talk, but what, what can I actually do? And, and there's so many like really basic things that could be done that are really interesting to do, but keep in the background in your head that this is really early in the technology. So we're less than 1% in. So it is, there are some barriers to getting in. So my example of the grocery store, you're paying in gold, that, that's an example of the future, not necessarily uh, today. So we're headed in that direction. And right now the user experience is not great, but nevertheless, if you want to get involved and my students uh, in my course uh, certainly are required uh, to get involved in, in a small way, so things like a savings rate that you can get, let's say five or 6%, um, which is really good compared to less than 1% in the US. And then people say, well, do I need to take a lot of risk for that by buying Ethereum or Bitcoin or something like that? And the answer is no. So you can actually exchange your currency for a so-called stable coin, and maybe it's linked to the US dollar, and then just deposit that in a DeFi protocol and earn 5%. And, and that is a small way to get in. So you don't bear the, the price gyrations of Ethereum. So the only volatility is the volatility of let's say the US dollar. 
And so this is a small way to actually get in. Anybody can download uh, a so-called MetaMask uh, wallet. So it's just an add-on into, let's say, Chrome. And you can establish a wallet, really simple uh, to do. Or you might want to set up uh, uh, an account with a broker, um, uh, like a centralized broker. Uh, in the US, it would be Coinbase or Binance, um, just depending upon what's available. And one advantage of having the broker is you don't need to worry about losing your private key. And that's something we haven't talked about. And that's what makes this space really special, that your cryptocurrency is defined by your private key. If you lose your key, then you lose your cryptocurrency. So the private key is linked to an address where anybody can see. So I can send you to that address um, some cryptocurrency, but only you I can spend it once I've sent it to you. And only you have the private key. So you don't need to worry about that stuff if you establish a, a brokerage uh, account, or you can go directly without the brokerage uh, into MetaMask. But again, this is early uh, time, and uh, and and the user interfaces are pretty crude at this point. Well, it's it's funny that that you mentioned the private key thing because th there. Are... It's interesting. Literally millions of of. Uh, of dollars equivalent, uh, so I, I that's certainly gotta gotta hurt. Um, oh, don't, uh, did you read this New York Times story? It's a great story, where um, this uh, programmer in San Francisco uh, had some Bitcoin and was worried about losing the private keys. So, uh, what? And there's various ways that you can protect your private keys. So for example, you can put them on a USB drive that's not connected to the internet. You can literally print them out and just store a hard copy somewhere. Um, there's many different ways, but this programmer decided, well, I'm going to use a, a hardware wallet. So it's a special device that's not connected to the internet and it's got a single password. So that's all you need to remember the single password. However, the programmer forgot the password. And to make things worse, <laughs> um, you get 10 tries. If you miss 10 in a row, then the hardware self-destructs and there's no way to recover any data. So this programmer has tried eight and failed on eight. He has two more tries and then everything uh, is destroyed. Uh, in that wallet is $220 million of Bitcoin. Gosh. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, this is uh, in my book, I, I talk about custody. This is, uh, this is a risk. So there's different ways that you can mitigate that risk. So you could use a custodian. That's one way to do that. Um, there's also, you, you kind of worry about, well, what if the custodian is hacked into, I would lose my, uh, my cryptocurrency. Well, there's also custodians that, that actually custody only part of your key. So a third, let's say, and you have another third on your smartphone, another third on your desktop. So you need two out of three to reconstruct the key. And so if the custodian is hacked, People, the hacker can do nothing with the one third. If you lose your smartphone, it's no big deal because we can reconstitute. So there's many, uh, again, this is early in the space. There's many different ways to mitigate uh, that particular risk, but it is a different type of risk. We're not really used to thinking like this. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about the, the 1% that, that you mentioned and, and you did, uh, you know, keep some inroads into that, but the, the, the specific use case for blockchain that we're talking about today is uh, decentralized finance, but that's only the tip of the, the iceberg, uh, isn't it? So what, what other use cases or what's the broader uh, case that, that, that you see going forward? So for blockchain technology in general? Well, yeah, uh, uh, the, you know, smart contracts and, and, and other, uh, you know. Yeah, so... Um, so my course, uh, Innovation in Crypto Ventures, uh, mainly focuses on decentralized finance, but we also talk about 
all of the other potential applications of this technology, a blockchain technology. And think of blockchain technology as a decentralized record of history that cannot be altered. So once it goes in, it's there forever. Okay, so it, it's, this is a property called immutabil immutability, which is a foundational concept in blockchain technology. So there are so many applications uh, of this technology. And, and we talk about uh, some of them. Decentralized finance or DeFi is the lowest hanging fruit. So it's the most obvious one. But there's other ones that are really obvious. So for example, supply chain. So blockchain already is widely used in supply chain problems. And, and think of a world where you're in the grocery store, you see some lettuce and it's got a QR on it. You scan the QR and you know where that lettuce was grown, whether it's organic or not you know the day that it was picked, you know every single stop on the supply chain, and you also know how long it's been on the shelf at the store. All of this enabled with blockchain technology. And it goes far deeper, you know, this is a, a simple example, but examples that are in uh, use today, the, the container ships, all tracked uh, in supply chain, blockchain uh, constructs. But it, it, it's, it goes even beyond this. So think of something that is not really well done today, and that's identity. So blockchain technology is kind of a logical uh, construct to basically uh, have your identity, uh, and it's easily uh, verifiable, and nobody can edit your identity. So once it's there, it's there forever. A hacker, no way. Uh, a government, no. Uh, it's just not possible uh, to do. So there are so many applications here. Uh, we talk about voting in my class, where you cast your vote and you've got instant results that are highly secure. Uh, so this, what we're really talking here is a transformation in many different industries, not just finance. Uh, the way that we do uh, business in the future will be blockchain enabled. And when I say blockchain, we need to be careful here because there's various different ways to implement blockchain. So I've already told you one way. So Bitcoin blockchain is just a peer-to-peer -peer mechanism, whereas uh, Ethereum is richer in that we've got, yes, the peer-to-peer, -peer, but also uh, the peer-to-contract to peer. So various different blockchains have their own uh, special uh, features. It's not one technology, it's multiple uh, technologies. Okay. Well, time is flying. I'm having a, a great time and so many things that, that I would like to, to talk with you. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, given our, 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 our specific audience, uh, there is this specific case within the the DeFi uh, uh, use case, which is uh, the, the current paradigm for investment in portfolios for financial assets. So that that's something that I am I am charged uh, with with uh, doing, and uh, as many of the of the people in this uh, call. So you know how, how that goes, and you're quite familiar with with it. It's uh, with with the trading. It's all the the market making, the the price discovery. Then there is, you know, very large opacity of uh, the pool holders, uh, liquidity uh, considerations, and or illiquidity, very high liquidity for many assets. Then there is the bid ask, uh, the counterparty, the operational risk uh, brokers, custodians, correspondents, Swift, you name it. So uh, I wonder if you could please explain, you know, how a DeFi alternative uh, would work uh, for, for this uh, specific uh, use case. So think about the future. We're just so used to using our commercial banks, our brokers, our 
stock exchanges, derivatives exchanges, um, and rely upon the central bank to bail us out when there's trouble. So what you need to do is to think beyond all of that. So think of a different model where the middle people are gone or greatly diminished uh, role and everything is decentralized. So that fundamentally changes the commercial banks uh, business models and they are at great risk, great risk and they know it. And I believe that most will survive with a different business model, but they are at great risk. Or the exchanges, uh, all of this stuff that you mentioned, like bid ass spread and, and things like that. It, this is all because there's a middle person, right? So you think about going to the bank and you want to, uh, you need to, to, to have like 10 million euros at the end of November, you've got dollars, they make a quote to you. And then some of the cuts, customers to the bank, the same bank, um, they need to sell 10 million euros at the end of November for dollars. So they get quoted a different rate. And that's the spread the middle person actually makes. So think of a different story where you put those two together as peers and you eliminate that spread. That's a good thing. So it's a good thing for the buyer, the good thing for the seller. And that's really what we're talking about in the future. So for asset owners, this will be a great uh, innovation. So if you're an asset owner, so if you're running a pension or something like that, this means reduced costs, uh, very bluntly. And, and reduce costs are just the, the easiest way to generate extra returns. And even if these costs seem small, like a fraction of a percent, they compound. And often these funds have a very long uh, horizon. But it's also just the way that we do trading. So think uh, we had mutual funds and then a lower cost uh, ETF uh, is launched. Well. In the future, all of the stocks will be tokenized. And the ETFs will be like CTFs, like crypto um, funds. So basically crypto in that you've got a collection of different tokens uh, in your fund. And yes, the ETF costs are lower than mutual fund costs, but these crypto uh, funds um, will be even lower cost. And then there's also this possibility of having available to you assets that while they might exist are like really illiquid and very difficult to trade. So we've got this concept in, uh, in DeFi called non-fungible tokens or NFTs. And an NFT is a very special a uh, token that's linked to a particular asset. They initially were called deeds. So let, let's say a deed to some land um, or something like that. That's very specific to the land. So it would have its own token. So these NFTs uh, live within the Ethereum uh, blockchain and it allows people to trade these assets that they wouldn't think of trading uh, before in their portfolio, like a painting or a piece of music. That, yeah, that, that painting existed and the music existed, but it was so illiquid that you couldn't do anything with it. So this technology allows us to greatly expand the scope of our portfolios, and it allows us to become much more diversified, which is a good thing uh, in finance. So for the asset owners, this is just an amazing technology that will allow uh, opportunities, both in reducing costs and expanding the portfolio uh, range of different assets that you can buy. All of that is really good for the asset owners. It's really good for consumers, right? So on many different dimensions, you get a real savings rate if you're a saver. Um, 
you're banked. So 1.7 billion people in the world are unbanked. So this is a technology where everybody's banked. If you've got a smartphone, and we're very close to that uh, already, uh, kind of worldwide adoption of smartphones, worldwide internet, all this stuff. So this is uh, a technology that allows us to grow. And my academic research points out that there's a direct link between reducing these financial frictions and economic growth. So if you reduce these frictions, you actually have the possibility of going on a different path. And we've been stuck, especially in the US, in Europe, in Japan, in this very slow growth uh, phase. So this is, uh, this is a problem with the current system and we've not addressed it. Our current commercial banking system is highly concentrated and that concentration means that they can do it. They can keep the savings rate really low and the borrowing rates uh, high and they can exclude people. And the example I give in my book of uh, a situation where it's not unbanked, it's underbanked. So think of a person with a bank account, an entrepreneur. They got a great idea and they're very excited about the idea. It's gonna generate 24% return on investment. They go to their bank. And they say, well, I need some financing for this great idea. They present the idea. The banker loves it. Says, this is a really good idea, but we're not going to lend you the money because we would prefer to deal with a larger client rather than a hundred like you. But given that you're a customer of the bank and that you've got a credit card, we'll extend the credit limit on your card so you can actually take this loan out. But and there's a big but here, the interest rate on the credit card debt is enormous. And the interest rate is so high that the project that looked really good is never pursued. And the project, this project I described with the 24% growth, that is exactly the kind of project that we need to pursue in our economies. That is the kind of project that basically jolts us out of this slow growth mode and allows us to talk realistically about real GDP growing at five to 10%. And that used to be, well, maybe China could get something like that. Uh, they can't anymore. We need to ask the question, well, why? And part of the answer is the financial frictions that exist today. So you can think of DeFi as reducing those frictions, you can think of DeFi as actually a technology of financial democracy where everybody uh, is the same. It is a technology of inclusion where it doesn't matter if you're a small business person, entrepreneur uh, going to the bank. Traditionally, it's a problem. In decentralized finance, you're just a peer. And it doesn't matter how big you are, whether you're asking for a $1,000 loan or a $10 million loan. So uh, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, possibilities here. Well, we, we, we could talk, we, we could have a whole session only on, on, the, on that topic. And, uh, but we, we're getting close to, to the end. We only have about uh, 10 minutes and uh, we have some questions from, from the audience. And, uh, but I do, I do want to, 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 for, for you to tell us a bit about how you see the, the, the central banks playing uh, in this, in this new, new, new world. And, and at that respect, we have also a, a, a couple of uh, uh, questions. One talking about uh, you know, the need for, for fiat money. If you're talking about uh, uh, you know, exchange uh, stable coins uh, to, to, to fiat money. Also, there is a question on, on how do you see, you know, uh, this decision by El Salvador to adopt uh, a Bitcoin as a, as a legal currency. Another question goes on the, on the role of uh, regulators in, in, in this environment. And, and that, that also relates to, 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 a, to an important topic, which is, uh, you know, the risk inherent in the, 
in the system. So I, I know it is a whole lot to, to throw at you, but yeah, uh, I uh, just wrote down uh, about seven different questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I, probably at least in, in, in general, certainly yeah. uh, central banks going forward, right. certainly uh, risk uh, going forward. Uh, I would say that, that that's probably the core. Yeah, so let me talk about this, the CBDC or central bank digital currency initiatives first. Um, when these cryptos first arose, I remember the reaction of Ben Bernanke, then chair of the Federal Reserve. And he said, hmm, this is a good idea. And it seems that it reduces transactions costs. Um, so I'm interested. And he's talking purely as an economist because economists disagree upon almost everything. There's only a few things they are uh, agreed upon. And one thing is that if you reduce frictions, that's a good thing. So uh, they agree upon that. It's a good thing, as I said, for economic growth. Uh, it's a good thing for consumers in general. So that was the story. And then it was largely ignored by central banks because a lot of what was happening was just speculative. So it was people gambling on, on Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency. And indeed, even today, most of the trading in the cryptocurrencies is purely due to uh, speculative uh, demand. So it was largely ignored until there was a realization that, well, does it really make sense that we're using paper currency 20 years from now? Uh, I don't think so. Like books have transitioned to digital, you know, all this stuff. So it kind of made sense that we needed to go digital plus the infrastructure of our system was just so antiquated that, uh, that something had to be done. And then a couple of other realizations occurred. Well, if we had a digital currency, then we could efficiently collect a value-added tax. So value-added taxes are so large right now because uh, many people just use the cash currency to avoid them. But if you take the cash currency away, then you can efficiently uh, implement a value-added tax and a border adjustment tax. So all that's kind of interesting. And then you think about instant monetary policy. So with a line of code, you can do a helicopter drop of money into everybody's wallet. And then people start thinking about zero or negative interest rates. A negative interest rate, you can only go so far because at some point, People say, well, why should I put my money in a bank and lose 2% a year when I can just hold the cash at zero? So, so then they sort of get interested, but then there's a, another realization. And it's very similar to what we talked about earlier, that money has been redefined. So remember I said that we, you've got the, the wallet and you've got the choice of how you want to spend. And maybe one of those tokens is a token that's linked to the national currency, or maybe not. Maybe it's linked to the US dollar, which is not your national currency. So the central banks realize that, oh, well, we, um, we are at risk of losing control of money. In my opinion, they've already lost control and they're too late. And there's very limited uh, number of things that uh, actually can be done at this point. So in my opinion, China will implement a central bank digital currency and they'll do it because they can. So privacy is a different sort of story in China than it is in literally the, the rest of the world. So the specter of a central bank digital currency, seeing every single transaction that citizens make, that to me is unacceptable in the US and it doesn't matter what your political leaning actually is. And the specter of the government having complete control. So this is not a decentralized blockchain based idea. These are ledgers that are controlled by the government. 
So remember I said with uh, blockchain technology, a key foundational feature is once it's in the blockchain, it exists forever. You can't alter it. Well, with these central bank digital currencies, it's not blockchain based and the government decides what to do with the transactions. And if they don't like you, they can literally take all of your money. So a tax of 100% with a line of code. So, so I think that it's a real long shot that the central bank digital currencies um, make a lot of headway, at least in the US over the, the next uh, 10 years. There's also hybrid models and many different models here. There's some models that preserve some anonymity, uh, people are trying to work them out, but by the time they work them out, it's just too late um, because these already exist. Indeed, think about, uh, and this is kind of an interesting example, think about a country in South America, which I'm not gonna name, um, and suppose that country's got 700% uh, inflation, which, um, which if you're rich in that country is annoying, but only annoying because you've got a bank account in Miami in US dollars. But if you're not rich, you get hammered by this 700% uh, inflation and you don't have the means to establish a bank account uh, in US dollars in, in Florida. So, so again, think of this technology. So the rich have basically got around the central bank by dollarizing uh, their wealth. But now the people that aren't rich, but have a smartphone can have on their smartphone, US dollar a token. Okay, so if you really think about what's happened, that you can effectively disintermediate the uh, the central bank and the central bank will will try these central banks will try to make things difficult and of course there's risks uh, involved here um but i think it's a it's a game they're going to lose uh, because it just makes sense that we should have a broader view of money it's not just the fiat that it's so intuitive that we can tokenize. So if I really want a gold standard, I can do that. I've got a gold coin. So it's feasible to actually do that. So El Salvador, just let me briefly mention, uh, they, um, they, as you know, they're already dollarized. So what's the deal here? And I, I think it was mainly a proof of concept that something like this could work uh, when it's rolled out on uh, a large scale uh, basis. And it's a small country also, which helps if you're going to do an experiment. So, so I think that is interesting, uh, but I also think that it's much too narrow uh, using uh, Bitcoin, which is a very volatile uh, cryptocurrency. So the volatile nature of Bitcoin, think of it as six times more variable than gold or six times more variable than the S&P 500. So there's other ways to do this with more stable uh, coins that might make more sense. But nevertheless, I think that it's, it's an interesting experiment. Is it the future for all countries? No. And, and maybe it was easy for El Salvador to do this because they've already given up control of their money. They've delegated that to the Federal Reserve in the US. And again, uh, other countries can do effectively, uh, the people within the country can do the same thing. That if they want to dollarize, it's easy to actually uh, do that. So overall, the central bank uh, digital currencies, we're going to hear a lot about this. Uh, they are solving some problems, I, I will admit to that, but they've lost their monopoly. There's healthy competition. Indeed, the last thing I will say, this is kind of interesting, that while the US is, uh, is actually considering what to do, we have all of these stable coins already in, in the US. So we've already got a digital dollar. So for example, Circle is the company behind uh, a coin called USDC, so US um, dollar coin. And one issue that they've got 
is, well, it's dollar for dollar. You, you send a dollar, they give you the token. But then what do you do with those dollars? So you could buy some treasury bills. You could maybe deposit those dollars in a bank. But the bank is risky. The bank could go bankrupt like Lehman Brothers did. So, so how do you deal with that? So Circle has actually applied to become what's known as a narrow uh, bank. And most of uh, the people online know what that is, but let me just, for those that don't, uh, a regular bank, you deposit dollars, let's say $100, and then the bank takes 10% or $10 and puts it as a required reserve at the Federal Reserve. And then the other 90, you lend out and make some money. With a narrow bank, if you deposit the hundred dollars, one hundred dollars goes to the Federal Reserve as both a required reserve and a excess reserve, and there's a small interest rate on the excess reserves. So that's what Circle wants to do. Um, the Fed is not going to support this, I'm sure, because effectively, what they would do is a de facto U.S central bank digital currency, because the Fed is effectively guaranteeing it. So even without going through all of the process, this can happen very quickly. And again, we've already got these US dollar uh, digital currencies. So uh, your question or the series of seven questions, I, I just want to emphasize that uh, there will be resistance. So the commercial banks will resist they need as much time as possible. They know what's going to happen. So they, they, they can see this. They're just buying time. Um, the central banks, I think uh, some of them, or at least groups within these central banks, understand the existential risk that they face. And, and they start telling stories about, oh, well, what about... Um, the central banks are really good at risk management, that if there's a problem in the economy, the central bank comes in and provides liquidity and stuff like that. And I'm just shaking my head because it's just, uh, it's just evidence that they don't understand. So in uh, the global financial crisis, the commercial banks were levered 50 to one or 100 to one, uh, Lehman Brothers was. So even the smallest the smallest uh, change could wipe out all of your capital. And the regulators had no idea what was going on. In decentralized finance today, um, the, the, the borrowing is, is collateralized. You're not gonna get 100 to one uh, leverage. So it, it basically is a technology that mitigates a lot of the risks that are inherent in our current system. In the US, um, I deposit dollars at my bank. My bank sends a, some of those dollars to, um, to the Federal Reserve as a required reserve, but then the bank can use that as collateral for borrowing and use it collateral for levered uh, borrowing. And if things go well, that's great. They get their payoff. If things don't go well, then they basically go to the Fed or the Treasury and ask for a bailout. And, and people will say to me, oh, well, yes, we know that happened in the global financial crisis, but all of that money was paid back. And that's a false argument because it doesn't include all of the millions of people that were unemployed and their lives disrupted by a severe uh, recession. So, so I actually would argue that the world of decentralized finance has got stabilization mechanisms built into it where this sort of stuff is less likely to occur. So it's not like the bank uh, being audited once a year by the FDIC or whatever regulator. The audit can happen in real time. You can see everything. It's completely transparent. And that's what we need. Let's see, Let's see. Well, Cam, uh, I mean, we went past uh, our, our time. I could spend another couple hours with you, and I'm sure my that that our audience uh, as well. Just uh, so many fascinating uh, things, and yet so little time. So it's been a great pleasure speaking with you, uh, Cam, uh, today about your book, 
And uh, we would like to, to express our, our gratitude to Paul Younes for his assistance in, in bringing him uh, uh, to our audience uh, today. It's been a great pleasure and we owe you a debt of gratitude on behalf of FLAR, our audience and Latin America as a whole. So thank you so much, Cam. Well, thank you for inviting me.